conference call. Uh, and we're thrilled that you're all here. My name is Julie Martin from the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Center for Consumer Engagement, which is a newly formed center at PCPCC, born out of the Patient Education Task Force. And this is our third call. Today, we are thrilled to have one of our co-chairs, Christine Bechtel, who's the Vice President for the National Partnership for Women and Families, um, give the presentation. And if you look at your screen, you should be able to see your name under the um, uh, list of names. It looks like we have about 39 people on the list. And if, you're, if the phone to the left of your name is not green, then you need to t type in your audio code. And you type, uh, or onto your phone, click the pound sign, your audio code, and the pound sign again. And your phone should turn green, and that will enable you to speak. So for the first few slides, everyone will be muted. And then if you want to ask a question uh, on your screen, you'll, you should see a button that says, uh, raise your hand, I believe. And with that, um, I will turn this over to Christine. Terrific. Thanks so much, Julie. So um, welcome to uh, the third call, as Julie said, for the Center for Consumer Engagement. I think we've got a lot of new folks joining um, the call and, um, and some existing work group members. So I wanted to start by reminding everybody that the mission of the Center for Consumer Engagement is to ensure that the medical home model is truly patient-centered. And we want to do that by facilitating consumer involvement and leadership in its design, ongoing practice, and evaluation. So we created two tasks for ourselves. And the first one was to figure out ways to ensure a strong consumer voice in the PCPCC itself. And um, Rob Dribben and Rosie Sweeney, um, as those of you who were on last month's call, um, helped us craft a set of recommendations which we're in the process of implementing. Um, so that we can better coordinate with other centers and make sure that consumer voices are heard throughout the work and the leadership of PCPCC. Sorry, guys. I think I hit my mute button by accident. So our second task um, is to develop a set of best practices for consumer engagement in demonstration projects and pilots. Um, and those best practices would be focused on how um, we can ensure effective consumer engagement in the design, ongoing practice, and evaluation of medical home initiatives. Um, and that's really the task we're going to dive into today. So um, I'm going to do a few slides um, to um, help orient some of the newer folks who are joining us. Um, about what this work is and why it's important. But then what I'm hoping we can do is dive into uh, getting our hands dirty and um, getting your input and feedback on how we can go about moving this particular task forward. Um, so let me take a second and say that I know we have a lot of new folks on the phone. If you um, are new, um, and you want to um, join the Center for Consumer Engagement on an ongoing basis as a participant, um, you should email Relia at the PCPCC and uh, make sure that he has your email. Relia, do you want to give your um, email address quickly? Yeah, it's R-U-G-R-I-N-I-C at PCPCC.net. And, and Relia, is it's, over the, it's also located on the website in a number of places, so you can get it from there as well. Terrific. Thanks, Relia. You're doing a great job helping us stay coordinated. So let's, um, so let's dive into um, the second task here, which is developing best practices. I wanted to give everybody on the phone some context for why we think this is important right now. Um, and in a, in a nutshell, it's because of the momentum that the medical home model has. So we've got 27 pilots in 18 different states. Um, we've got 44 states in D.C. who've passed laws or having, uh, you know, are doing some sort of PCMH activity. We've got 37 states working on the medical home model in their Medicaid or in their children's health insurance program. And then there's um, activity happening uh, in the VA, DOD, HRSA, and CMS, of course. So a lot of momentum. This is a slide, um, the next slide that you see, is from the PCPCC that gives you um, an interesting lens, which is if you look at the yellow states, there's only five states where um, there hasn't been any formal activity identified yet for, for the rest of the country. 
um, this ball is moving forward. Um, and on top of the activity that's happening, we have, of course, uh, provisions of the new health care reform law that relate to um, the patient-centered medical home. I won't read all of these because you're looking at the same screen that I am, um, but there are, um, um, suffice it to say, provisions about uh, Medicaid um, and helping people with chronic conditions to find a medical home and be part of that. There's accountable care organizations, there's workforce training, there's grants, um, and probably one of the most important is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at CMS. Um, and their job is going to be to figure out what innovative payment and delivery models are working. And they've got a new and expanded authority for CMS to begin moving those effective models out nationally. And many people are um, thinking that medical home and ACO will be among those that get um, piloted and, and expanded. So as we think about all this federal, state, and local activity, um, one of the things that, you know, particularly for the consumer organizations on the phone um, who've been working with us for some time, one of the things that's important is that we think about these medical home models from a consumer perspective. Um, and so um, as a work group, we've talked about this idea that we could create a set of best practices for consumer engagement that would inform federal, state, and local approaches to the medical home model um, and help them really succeed in this area. So we, we clearly want to contribute to the debate around the medical home model, and um, we want to do that by actually making sure it is patient-centered. Um, and we think it's important to highlight some gaps, if we can, um, in how well or you know, where the gaps are that people need to fill um, among the current pilot sites, um, as well as highlighting innovations that they're um, currently engaged in. Um, and, you know, in the end, of course, our final goal is in this work it would really be to position consumer involvement and leadership as a top-tier priority uh, for policymakers, stakeholders, and, of course, the medical home model um, itself. Okay. So I'm going to lay out a process for the work. Now, we've got about 56 people on the phone, which is, I think, more than we expected. It's terrific. Um, but we want to actually engage you in a discussion. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go over um, um, you know sort of what we're thinking here, and then I'd welcome either questions or input or feedback uh, at any time by, as Julie said earlier, raising your hand, um, and then at the end I think we can do even more um, to open it up for Q and A. So, as I just said, the goal of developing these best practices in consumer engagement would be to inform federal, state, and local approaches here um, and make sure that they are truly patient-centered. So I think where we need to start is figuring out what's the scope of consumer engagement that we're going to focus on. And we've talked in the past about two levels, the systems level and the patient level, that you've got to engage consumers at both ends of the spectrum. And so we're going to talk in a second about what that means. Second, we need to identify example best practices. There is a lot of existing work, particularly at the patient level, that's gone, um, that's gone before us that we should draw from. And I've included some um, potential you know, starting places in this slide deck. Um, third is to create some kind of a working definition or two around what we're talking about and then figure out how do we operationalize this. Do we want to do a survey of the pilots? Um, uh, you know, how, how can that be done? Is it possible, et cetera? And so that's, um, this is where we need your input for sure. Okay, so what we've talked about, and I'm, I'm using two distinctions here. One is patient level, one is systems level. They may or may not be sort of artificial. There's, I think, probably a couple of ways that we could do this, but let me explain what we mean. So when we talk about the systems level, um, this is the idea that you've got to engage consumers, uh, you know, consumer organizations and individual patients to provide input into how the medical home is going to work at what I have called sort of the systems level. So what services is it going to deliver? What are its policies and practices going to be? How is it going to be evaluated? So some examples of that might be as you have a multi-stakeholder um, you know, convening entity who is beginning to design what a medical home pilot in a state might look like, you could have consumer organizations um, or individual patients in leadership roles helping to design that. 
You could have advisory councils. You could do focus groups with individual patients to understand what it is that they're looking for from something like a medical home. You could do ethnographic observations. So, in other words, these are ways that you can engage consumer organizations, particularly in the overall design of the medical home um, and probably in its evaluation as well. The second piece is the patient level. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we've, um, this is really more the individual you know, level. So we're talking about um, you know, patient to provider, how can the provider support that patient in becoming a more engaged and activated patient. So what services does it need to offer? Shared decision making, care plans, doing patient experience surveys, providing access to medical information. That's what we sort of mean by um, patient level. Now the Center for Advancing Health has put forth a definition of patient engagement and they've, um, which they define as actions individuals must take to obtain the greatest benefit from the healthcare services available to them. So for our purposes, since we're talking about the medical home more um, from a provider and a systems perspective, our best practices should focus on what can the provider do, what can the medical home, what can the care team do um, to support patient engagement, to support those actions that um, individual patients need to take. So this is a, a place where I want to um, invite some discussion here. Um, um, so and I'm going to put um, one, one more sort of framework um, out there for us to think about, um, and that is there are, you know, in the mission of the center there are three domains that we've talked about, which is the design, the ongoing practice, and the evaluation of the medical home model, and the importance of, cons of uh, consumer and patient engagement in all three of those areas. So another way to look at this um, um, in, in it, it sort of in juxtaposition to a systems versus a patient level. Another way to look at this might be to just focus on those domains, design, ongoing practice, and evaluation, so that you know that the design is probably going to be the systems level. You know, talking to patients about what's important to them, you know, how do you want to have access to care after hours, um, you know, if we um, do care coordination services this way, what do you think of that? So before the model gets implemented, when it's being designed, doing consumer engagement at that level um, in the context of design. Ongoing practice, the most obvious connection there is sort of the patient level and how is it, um, you know, how are, are, is the care team engaging the patients on a daily basis through patient experience surveys or shared decision making, for example. And then the third domain being evaluation, which is probably both levels, right? It's probably things like patient experience surveys at the patient level, but then at the systems level, you know, once a year, and I'm, you know, making this up, but once a year the medical home could convene or twice a year or four times a year could convene a um, consumer advisory, uh, you know, leadership group and say, okay, this is what our patients are telling us. These are what our challenges are. Um, you know, how, how should we address these? What do you think of moving forward in these ways? We're considering adding, adding new services. This is what we're thinking. And so it's more of an ongoing um, evaluation and design mode. All right, so before we kind of get into what we do next, um, I want to do a, a gut check with folks and, and ask for any feedback that you have about um, this idea that we would somehow collect some best practices that would reflect um, the kind of levels that I've just talked about, however we organize them. Um, and then next what we'll do is talk about our options for collecting and disseminating those best practices. But before we go forward, I, you know, I think this is a great time to do a gut check and ask people, is this helpful to you? you know, do you think this is going to be helpful if, if in a couple of months we could release a set of best practices that we call on um, all medical homes to be um, using as they move forward in consumer and patient engagement. So Lauren, you're on. Do you want to um, give people instructions for how to raise their hand and ta otherwise talk? Yeah, basically the way to do it, just because we have so many people, is that if you have any input or would like to speak, if you could just raise your hand on the control panel, that's an option that you have. Um, it's kind of, there's three options, a full screen, and then right below that it says raise hand. Um, right now, for instance, um, yeah, there's a couple people doing that. So I guess if you just want to call out, 
and and click on the, um, the microphone next to their name with the red line through it, it'll unmute them if you want to go through. Oh, great. It. Okay, so and Gary. And also, if you can just introduce yourself and your and your organization, um, just so we can kind of all get to know each other. That'd be great. Great. Thank you. So, um, Gary, I think I just okay. unmuted you. Why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is Gary Reeks, uh, the uh, National Program Manager for the uh, Patient Center Medical Pilots for United, just as an introduction. Uh, is there, I had a question about the, the scope. Is the scope limited to patient engagement uh, uh, materials? Um, can you tell me what you mean by patient engagement materials? Uh, well, when we we, uh, we uh, 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 have this on our radar as well, is, is when you look at the definition of consumer, and patient engagement, it includes the, the touch points of all of the uh, health services that they have available. Nice definition. Uh, but what that implies is not only uh, is the, when you say consumer, is you also have best practices for uh, promotion of patient-centered and medical home that can come through all of the different touch points, not only the practice itself, but other facilities that come in contact with the patient, such as um, EDs, uh, in hospitals, uh, specialists, uh, community services. You also have the employer, which is a large player in this type of communication as well. So is there a, is the definition include all of those touch points or are we just limited to uh, the uh, practice to patient? I think that's a great question. And, and Julie, I don't know if you have some comments as well. I mean, my initial reaction is we ought to not limit ourselves too much early on in thinking about what some best practices might be. But on the other hand, the locus, I think, of our, um, the center of our focus here is really the medical home model. And so to the extent that, you know, for example, we find a practice that is um, doing patient engagement by um, leveraging some employer resources, and that's a good thing, for patients, then I, I can't imagine we would w not want to include that. But I think until we get into the particular examples, I think then we'll, we'll know. Mm -hmm. Does that help, Gary? Yes. I, I mean, basically the, the same conclusion we had was that uh, like 75% better of our efforts are now simply focused on shoring up and improving and, and developing the, the communications between the practices and the patient. But I just you know, just, but that, that other ring, those other rings of communication, uh, I would suggest we just keep in, uh, keep in sight as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Gary. Um, so we're going to go to um, Bonnie Schofield. Oh, hang on, Bonnie. I have to unmute you. Sorry. Go ahead. Bonnie. Okay. My bad. So we can't hear Bonnie. Um, so let's go to um, Donna Cryer, and I'm trying to unmute you. All right, I think you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, gotcha. Okay, great, thank you. I think that taking um, sort of a baseline level of what uh, patient engagement activities are already going on in the models and pilots that exist um, is a very important step so that we know where the gaps are, what we're improving on, and if there are, um, if there are in fact, best practices um, to highlight and, and, and build on those. So I think that this is a very important step. Oh, fabulous. Thanks, Donna. Um, OK, Diana, I'm going to attempt to unmute you here. Oops, I just muted you again. Just a second. <laughs> I got fat fingers. Hold on. OK, Diana, go for it. Hi, this is Diana Demboba from HRSA. Uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau, and I really like um, those three levels. Um, I really think this will be wonderful. My question is, and um, uh, we we know that um, you know a lot of this maybe is is, is toward adults, but um, are you going to also in look at children? And even if you aren't. Um, a lot of adults, some of their mm, decision-making and health-seeking behavior and interpretation of what goes on in the office is also impacted by their family and by their cultural beliefs. So will you be integrating anything around, you know, family-centered care, cultural competence, you know, even though this is based uh, on the patient? Thank you. 
Yeah, great question. Um, so what I would say is um, that I would say two things, and Julie, I can't jump in at any time. Okay. I'm getting to ask you. Um, my reaction to that is um, that a lot of what we would recommend as best practices would be applicable to medical homes that focus on multiple types of populations. So it might be a pediatric medical home or it might be another kind of medical home. The question is just going to be as you engage, um, you know, if, if you, as you engage patients in um, the design of the model, that's probably going to be their caregiver or their parent in the case of, you know, this particular population. And then I think it's a really good question. Um, I, family centered care should be um, critical, and I'm wondering how patient engagement at the patient level differs for kids. And I think that's a really interesting question to explore that I don't know the answer to. Um, Julie, do you have any thoughts? I'm I sort of in the same boat, working with okay. mostly adult practices. So, but so I think that's a good question that we ought to. Um, um, you know, think through and would welcome yeah. your involvement as we um, begin this work, you know, how, how patient level engagement might differ for kids. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going in sort of alphabetical order here. So we're going to go to Ellen Andrews. Ellen, did I unmute you? No, oh, I did not. Hold on. You know, um, Lauren, I, can I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can't it. unmute Ellen. She can't because she has not entered her PIN number yet because she's got a gray, a gray phone. But okay, so Ellen, you could either type in your question. There she is. Or... There she is. Oh, good. Ellen. Yep, I'm here. Hi. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm from the Connecticut Health Policy Project, and we have a um, a, uh, a law set in place for a, a large health reform piece, and I co-chair the medical home, the patient-centered medical home, I have to keep saying it's the patient-centered medical home, um, committee that is tasked with coming up with parameters for how to run this in, going forward in Connecticut uh, for what will be a very large pool. Um, and, and I have to do it by July 1st, really by June 1st, so if, if the sooner you get this done, the way this would be phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, we're on it. <laughs> all right. But one thing that would be helpful is probably this, you know, doesn't come up with everyone on this call because we got onto this call, but I have to make the case to the other stakeholders around the, the you know, it's sort of like, yes, patient-centered. It's kind of window dressing. Oh, of course, Ellen, and I feel this sort of pat on my head um, that they care about consumers, but they don't really get it. If there was something we could get that would help make the case for why, why it's important to providers, to payers, to consultants, to all the people around the table, why they really need to pay attention to this, not just do it because they, you know, feel like ethically they should. Oh, you know, that's great. Um, if you can follow up with Relia um, and make sure that we have your email address, the May issue of Health Affairs um, is totally focused on primary care. There's going to be a lot of stuff in there about the medical home, and um, we actually did write a piece on consumer engagement and why it's so important. And part of what we talked about was that there's, you know, a lot about medical home and ACOs that feels a little bit reminiscent of the old school managed care that consumers really fought against and makes a case there. So it may be that um, if we can engage you in looking at that piece and thinking about if we should do a shorter piece, mm. like a fact sheet that, you know, sort of is why does this matter? Yeah, that, that we would can be great. work with you to do that. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right, so let's go to um, uh, Deidre Gifford, uh, who's, I think I just unmuted. Hi, Christine. How are you? Good. How are you? Great to hear your voice. Thanks. Um, so I'm the uh, project director for the Rhode Island multi-payer demonstration. So I'm um, making this comment from the convening organization perspective. And uh, so we've been at this for a couple of years in Rhode Island. And just to, uh, for uh, Ellen down in Connecticut, um, if you want to get in touch with me about uh, any of our work in Rhode Island, if it could be helpful to you, uh, please feel free. Um, but my comment to you, Christine, was um, I really like the way you've um, 
broken out the consumer engagement to the patient level and the system level. I think it's a really useful distinction. We've been stumbling over that in our conversations for a number of years. So I think to have that sort of formal dichotomy made from PCPCC is, is really a good thing and to separate out your, um, your best practices in that way. But I wanted to make a comment in terms of priorities um, for your work. And um, my view from the convening organization side of things is that where the um, pilots are really struggling is on the um, systems level engagement. There's a lot out there at the patient level. I would yeah. not say that everybody's doing it well or everybody's doing it at all, but there's an abundance of resources for the patient level engagement. Whereas at the systems level engagement, um, we don't really know how to do it. And in talking to other pilots, I think um, it's kind of a general feeling that the systems level engagement is a much more challenging piece. So in terms of prioritizing, if, if in fact you need to, one, one state's opinion or one person's opinion from a convening organization would be to prioritize the systems level engagement um, first. Yeah, you know, I'm really glad that you raised that point, Deirdre, because that's where I was at in my own thinking and, and thinking, too. There's a lot out there at the patient level, and I, I almost wondered if what we would do is find interesting results about the patient level, that folks are doing it to varying degrees, but that there's probably very little they're doing at the systems level. So I'd love um, feedback from people as we continue our conversation today, or if you don't get a chance to talk, you know, to email Relia, because... Um, as to whether we should act, should focus on both levels or just focus on sort of the systems level um, elements. Um, I can make arguments both ways. So thanks, Deirdre. That's fantastic. OK, let's go to um, Catherine Serio. Uh, you should be unmuted. Hi, Christine. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Catherine Serio. I'm with HealthWise in Boise, Idaho. We um, make uh, consumer-facing um, education materials, and we're moving um, into the MR space a ton, as seems to be the general trend in healthcare. And I guess what I'm wondering is, I was just looking at an article um, this week about how um, dissatisfied and more disengaged in the exam room consumers are feeling because of the presence of the EMR, and um, I, was one, I was wondering what the thoughts of this group were in terms of, and, and this might, again, be too into the weeds, but um, what the thoughts of this group were around doing some, um, making some recommendations about how to have that third party in the exam room and not have us move in the opposite direction of how, of the, how we're trying to move with consumer engagement. It's a great question, and it's, it's a very important issue. Um, I actually think for our purpose here, it's, it's probably, I wouldn't call it out of scope, but I would say it's really super specific in scope. Um, and I almost wonder if we should, um, I know John Seidel's on the phone, if that should be something that the Center for eHealth Adoption and Exchange, which is doing some work around patient engagement through HIT, that they might also consider taking up. I mean, I'm happy to be disagreed with, but I think, it, you know, it could be one example of best, of best practice in patient engagement, but I think um, what you, what would, what's really needed is more along the lines of the work that, um, I'm going to blank on his name, he's from the Mayo Clinic, um, Bachman, I think is his last name, that he's done around how you talk to patients with an EHR in the room, and I don't think we're going to get that detailed in this particular piece. So, but I, I think it's good, and, and we should flag it for um, for the center. Does that sound good? No, that sounds great. I'm glad okay. to know that. I was going to ask if there are other um, pieces of the, the greater um, organizational structure here that have that on their radar, and it sounds like they do, so that's terrific. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, okay, so I, I'd like to go to um, Diana, but I can't remember, Diana, if you asked your question already, it, um, Denboba? So I'm going to unmute you just to double check, because you may have asked. Diane, are you there? OK, I'll bet you she asked her question. All right, so let's go to um, Sherry Erickson, who um, I'm going to unmute. OK, Sherry, do you have a question? 
Yeah, hi Christine. This is Sherry Erickson um, with the American College of Physicians and also one of the co-chairs of the Center for Multi-Stakeholder Demonstrations at, this, at the PCPCC. And one thing, I know that um, in some demonstrations they have engaged patients at the practice level, not so much, I mean, around their care certainly, but also around practice improvement um, and, and sort of in the transformation process and in um, uh, maintaining their services and, you know, keeping and advising them um, over, you know, the course of their transformation and beyond. And I don't know really where that fits because it sounds like the, pra the patient level you're talking about here is really patient engagement in their care, which is important, and I think that's something that, I, I mean, I actually really like this framework quite a bit. I just wasn't quite sure where that fit or, or something along those lines would fit. Patient engagement and practice transformation? Yes. What, can you give me an example? Well, so if a practice um, establishes its own, within a demonstration project, so say there's a demonstration project, they have a patient advisory group or patients engaged at the planning level of that, that's clearly system level. But say the practice has also engaged their own patient advisory, either, either a couple of patients or a, maybe a small little committee of patients from their practice um, to advise them at the practice level. Uh, and they would be advising them on what? I guess on um, issues related to their transformation, so how that's going and, and how they could do something better, you know, really at the ground level more than at the pilot level. So I think that's what I, I would call systems level, where okay. they're saying, look, as a system of care, you know, if your quality of diabetes care is at X, Y, or Z level, you know, and you want to implement this intervention, here's what I think patients are going to think of that. Okay. Do I, is it just me or do I have a ton of static on the line? A that ton. is true. I don't know if it's, it might be my phone. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It might be my phone. Maybe I Lauren, can you help us with this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can just um, unmute us all sequentially until we find the culprit, potentially. Be me. I, good Lord, it could be me. Oh, not Sherry. I'm going to unmute you, Sherry. I hope it's not me, or I'll have to call in from a cell phone, which I guarantee you will be worse. Okay, so let's go to um, Becky Pasternak, and I can't tell if that's an LK or not on your last name, so I do apologize for that. Um, but Becky, are you there? Um, I am. Great. And I'm with the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, and I am joined by our Director of Care Management, Management Program, as well as our Director of Member Services. And we recently transitioned. Uh, Lauren, I'm sorry. Can you tell um, where what line the static is coming from? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just. I'm sorry, everyone. I just I just unmuted everyone other than the staff. So um, if you could just unmute whoever was just speaking, and we'll just start that way. We'll kind of reset ourselves. Gotcha. Okay, so that was Becky. That was good. Whatever you did seems to work. Okay, Becky, we, we're, you're unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, we recently transitioned. Uh, we had a, a partially capitated um, primary care case management system in Oklahoma transition to a what we're calling a patient-centered different um, with reimbursement strategies that include the care management fee, the fee for service for services, and then a, an incentive payment. But so our design, we focused really at the provider level, hitting providers. And I guess the assumption was kind of it was, but actually it does not seem to have been seamless to members because they don't really know what it means to have your PCP as a medical home and what responsibilities that brings for them to and bring what we could do for the future to educate our, our membership level. We actually have a medical home, a sample medical home agreement that we encourage our higher level medical homes to use. But we would like to bring that agreement down to just our basic, we're, we do a tier-based medical home. 
And we're just wondering how to bring that down to the lower tier and also how we would really evaluate the effectiveness of that and, you know, and how you, I guess, can reach our, our particularly in our, our case, our Medicaid members. And then also for states that have engaged multi-payers, um, just discussing with them how they move to involve other payer sources. Okay, I'm not, well, hold on. All right, I'm gonna, I'm worried about my phone. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, some of that I think is out of scope for what we're talking about here, um, but the um, Center for Care, and I know Sherry's on, so we, she may be able to follow up with you about some of those questions. And I think um, it was a little thing, but if they have Australia, we could take a look at that, and that may be helpful. Yeah, I think because we we're you know we're still working on the system, I guess, and you know, and are trying to get to the patient level, but believe that we need to focus um, even more on not only the patients being engaged in their care, but understanding what it truly means to have a medical home. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's been a fair amount of work done in this area where, um, uh, you know, we, we've done some brochure materials. This group, when it was a task force, had done. And then um, I know that the Center for Advancing Health has done um, a version of, of an, you know, kind of an agreement between the practice and the provider. So what we're talking about when we talk about the systems level is, engaging consumers in the design of the medical home period so that they can be part of shaping what is an appropriate role for consumers in the medical home and not just ask to understand and participate in it, but actually be part of shaping what does that mean and how is that going to be operationalized. So a good example is that a lot of medical homes um, are going to want to find ways to control costs by um, not necessarily restricting, but by, you know, sort of limiting choice in some areas. So some, some medical homes may decide that they want to limit um, um, care in the sense of who the patient could go to as a way that, you know, because they want to focus only on other providers who they know are operating at a high level of quality or a reduced level of cost or whatever the case may be. But if you ask patients about that, I think what you would get is an interesting idea. If you convene a group of, of consumer organizations and individual patients, because you need both, what they probably tell you is, you know, I understand the need for you to do that, but I don't want to feel like I'm being limited. But if you were able to offer me some services that would end up with the same arrangement, so for example, if you would make my appointment for me with the specialist, if you would follow up of your own volition with the specialist and get information back and call me proactively and help me understand my test results. If you deliver a better suite of services, then I'm probably not going to care as much about who you want me to see, for example. So that's really what the focus of what we're trying to do at the systems level is, is rather than tell patients, here's what your role or responsibility is in the medical home, ask them about it first and then work with them to communicate that to the individual patients. So I hope that helps. Okay. I, I, and I don't know if I'm still on unmute, but um, that is exactly what we're, what we are trying to focus on, um, because we really think that in in our design, we, uh, because we had a very short time to really bring it up, and so our focus really was just on engaging providers. And so now we need to go into that, that other level of engaging our consumers on how to move forward. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. Okay. All right, so I think that clears out most of the people who had their hands raised. Lauren, if you want to check the written questions, it's hard for me to do that. But let me keep going in terms of um, how we need to kind of operationalize this work. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to get, there we go. All right, so there are a couple of ways that we could come up with some best practices. I had to switch phones here. Okay, so there's a couple ways that we could, could identify best practices. One would be survey existing um, and, and planned medical home models themselves. We could also include in that, 
employers, health plans, or convening entities, and we could ask them what are they doing. And we, we, in order to do that survey, we would need to come up with some examples. You know, for example, are you um, including um, patients on the you know, community of people who are designing the medical home? Are you, do you have a patient advisory council, et cetera, et cetera? And then ask people about that. And then leave some open-ended questions so that they could um, fill in things that they're doing that we didn't think of and identify, therefore, some of the more innovative practices that are going on. So that's one option. The second option, if we either can't figure out how to operationalize that or we don't think there's enough going on in, in the world to, to survey, um, would be not to do a survey, but rather to craft a set of best practices based on some of the work that's gone before us, which I'll mention in a second, um, and you know, maybe you know, putting something out for public comment and trying to identify things that we haven't thought about or doing interviews. Um, but we, would, you know, we wouldn't have to necessarily do a survey. And then the third um, um, thing that I think we should do, regardless of whether we do a survey or not, is then communicate those best practices, make some policy recommendations that for how we can get these best practices implemented more broadly, um, and, um, and then release it publicly. And I don't think we can do that by the July stakeholder meeting, but perhaps by um, October. So th those are the options I've thought of. I'm absolutely open to other ones. Um, let me just tell you some things that I've thought of that we could draw from so that when I open it back up for questions here in another second, I'd like to get your input on whether we should do a survey or not do a survey um, or do some other method. And then I'd like to get your input on any resources you think we ought to draw from. So I mentioned before the patient engagement framework that the Center for, Advancing for Health, um, Center for Advancements in Health has done. And they've done that from a patient perspective. And so we would adapt that and basically map it to Again, that's sort of the patient level. What can the care team do to support the patient level engagement? The second component is um, the um, consumer principles for patient-centered care in medical home, which is actually something we did um, along with about 30-plus consumer organizations. Um, and, and that gets to, to systems level and also, but mostly probably patient level. And I know the Institute for Family Center Care, Bev Johnson, that she's done a lot of work around um, councils and family, you know, patient and family councils and other ways of the, that lie more at the systems level. And then finally, we know that we've got um, consumers in the field, um, and I'm thinking in particular Oregon, Maine, Minnesota, I know for sure, who consumer advocates um, who have participated in the design um, of medical home initiatives. Um, and we can certainly talk to them about their experience and how they were engaged, et cetera. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, whether we should use the slide that you see in front of you, which is the PCPCC's definition of the medical home. Now, I can say that I think when I look at this from a patient engagement lens, and, and Julie, I know you've raised a number of comments too, there are some, um, you know, things that we would probably change, like patients have the option of being informed and partners. You know, there's some language on here that, that I think is missing and that we would um, recommend changes to, but it's an interesting framework to think about patient engagement in each of these green arrow areas, clinical information systems and access and care coordination. So that's another resource. Okay. So let me give you the next steps, and then I'll open it up for the last few minutes to get some more comments and ideas. Um, so if we do a survey, we're going to have to figure out how to operationalize it. Um, and somebody who is brilliant this week gave me the idea of seeing if we could work with NCQA to survey some of their practices, whether the family docs or NASHP, for example, which is the state health policy folks, have um, connections into some of the practices or the PCPCC itself. Um, and because um, the PCPCC can survey the convening entities, as I understand it, from Sherry, who spoke earlier. So we'll need to draft working definitions of what we mean by patient and consumer engagement and then categorize best practices under each. And I, I think it would be wise for us to engage people like Bev Johnson and some of the consumer leaders who've worked particularly at the systems level, because as Deidre said earlier, we do really know a lot about patient engagement at the patient level, but in terms of the systems level, we, we, we could um, have our next couple of phone calls be part working session and part sort of hear from people who've done this before. 
So that's, um, I think that's it, yeah. So that's, that's the question. So survey, no survey, other ways for us to assess this information, particularly the consumer engagement at the systems level, um, and any other reactions that you guys have. So now is the time um, for questions or comments. Okay. Can you see in the in the question and answer box? There's been a lot of good points and questions raised. Oh, I can't see in the Q and A box. I don't know where they are. Oops. Something. <laughs> Ooh, you have taken control, haven't you, Lauren? Good for you. Yes, I have. Okay, so <laughs> um, how about you find me the first question? Because I um. <coughs> Each open the box, people have provided um, some good insights to some of the points that were brought up along the way, and then others were asking questions via text. Oh. Um, for all those attending, you can see there's a question box where you can answer questions, and then we can see them and um, either respond publicly on the call or answer via private message. Okay, so here we go. Oh, this, okay. Okay, Sherry, I see your question. What do you want to I was just going to put this. Okay, thank you, Don. I see that. That we um, would endorse inclusion of Nashby. Also, if I people want to raise their hands, oh, yeah. they absolutely can. Okay, so people are giving us some good resources in here. That's terrific. There's a number of people that would like to raise their hands now that maybe want to speak to some of this as well. Okay, all right. So. Um, all right, so um, let's go to Deirdre again. Are you there, Deirdre? Yeah, um, just a quick comment, Christine. Um, I was thinking as you align or think about your best practices uh, to consider uh, alignment with what NCQA is doing around their recognition process. Because I, I know, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that they've been thinking about redoing uh, their recognition uh, around patient-centeredness, and uh, for, for better or for worse, for a lot of practices, that recognition process or those states locally based recognition process is going to be what drives what they do around uh, consumer engagement. So I guess worst case scenario would be that the recognition programs come up with some standards that they want practices to adhere to around consumer engagement, and PCC PCPCC comes up with different recommendations about yeah, what no, I agree. to do. So. Well, I envision that it would actually, we would be making, when I mentioned those policy recommendations, that part of those recommendations would be to say to NCQA, this is what we think is important, and, you know, we got to get some alignment. So I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, go to um, Diana Denboba. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry, I was getting my... Raise hand, lower hand mixed up, but, um, you know, if, if you're looking at doing a survey, and I think that maybe, you know, you could, and I don't know what your budget is like, maybe you want to do a combination of surveys and interviews, but in terms of the language, you know, on your, your website, um, you reference some tools, and even though they may be specific to kids, I think, um, some of the information in there might be helpful to you and also to the person who was asking about, um, you know, how do you get consumers engaged and, and how providers understand medical home. Um, you have from Carl Cooley in New Hampshire the medical home index, and it has an index for providers and families, and I think it's been shortened. There's also with family voices, national uh, family-centered care assessment tool that they use for, um, it's for providers and for families and um, ideas for families is how, um, is what they're getting, you know, part medical home. And um, I'm glad you mentioned the Institute for Family-Centered Care, but you know, you can also use uh, Family Voices as well. The American Academy of Pediatrics has the National Center for Medical Home Initiatives, as you, you know, know. And um, they have some best practices up from states um, that maybe you could 
use, you know, even though it's pediatrics. Um, Are they best practices in consumer engagement? Uh, in medical home general. Yeah, so what we want to do is really get to the best practices in patient level consumer engagement and system Yeah, level. I would have to go through them. I think they do have some things up, but if you'd like, I could go through them. For yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, you mentioned, I want to take this opportunity because it's a perfect parlay to say, you mentioned our budget. We have no budget. It's all volunteer. So um, all of you on the phone <laughs> expect to get your hands dirty, and I really hope that you'll join the um, Consumer Engagement Center on an ongoing basis because this is all volunteer. So all the work that we're talking about, I'm hoping we'll be able to do together. So it'd be terrific if you look at that and, and send along anything that might be helpful. Sure, and also some of our family-to-family -family health information centers out there are working directly with um, around medical home issues. Some, like Maryland, are working directly with their um, AAP chapter chairs. So, um, you know, when you think about it, if you're interested in, in getting any of their ideas, I can help you with that. Terrific. Thanks, Diana. Sure. Okay, so um, Catherine, you have a um, a comment or question, Catherine Serio. Yes, uh, thanks, Christine. Just a thought on the survey process. Um, yeah. Somebody I made a, a very good uh, point earlier on that there's an awful lot of data out there already, and um, and I'm not speaking against the need for a survey, but um, if the goal, part of what I think you're suggesting the survey do is go to pilots and ask them about best practices. Um, Another source of data may be to go to uh, hospitals or larger provider groups and ask them if they would share data they've already collected on consumer satisfaction. I mean, see, see what trends, as you comb the data and the questionnaires that have already been circulated, see what trends emerge around what is working very well for folks and what themes are routinely disappointing consumers. Because I think we have a lot of that data. Yeah, so let me make a clarification. I think what we're trying to do here is to say that patient satisfaction or, more importantly, patient experience surveys are a best practice for consumer engagement, but we're not diving into the data in them. We're looking for the tools that are the best practices for engaging consumers. But what I think your comment raises for me is the idea that, and Bev Johnson certainly knows this, that as hospitals, for example, have implemented new models of care or undertaken safety initiatives, that they often will form a patient advisory council. So it may be the case that for identifying the best practices, we ought to look beyond, at least for defining and identifying them, look beyond just what medical homes are doing and think about how other healthcare initiatives have um, done successful consumer engagement and how that might translate to a medical home environment. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's exactly capturing the spirit of what I'm saying, and also um, that those groups that you've talked about, the patient advisory panels, would be wonderful to survey as well. So the survey doesn't end up going primarily, and I know this is not your intent, but going primarily to clinicians or administrators. Well, I think the survey was designed to, to simply say, did you do this stuff? Did you do any of this? So that we could turn, so in that case, it would be, I think, a lot of clinicians and administrators, but also I think we would have to have health plans and employers and other convening entities who can say, no, I didn't do that. Or, yeah, we do, you know, as a matter of practice, yes, we do do these things. And then we could point to the percent of people who are or are not doing various things and make some recommendations. So, okay. I know we only have a couple minutes left, so um, let's go to Stacy um, Hirsch. Are you on the line? I am. Okay, go for I, it. Just as we were talking, I had a quick question. I'm um, my title is medical home coordinator for the USED program at the U of A, and it's obviously based out of a clinic. But I was just kind of wondering, so at, at a at a at a direct level, because uh, I'm very new to all this, um, who is who are the people who are actually applying this to the clinics, to the medical facilities? Because I'm a social worker. I work half time under a federal grant in order to learn and implement, um, learn about and implement a medical home model in the clinic that I work at. Um, so how, what, at, what, do you see what I'm asking? Like, so, there's, 
who's actually implementing the patient engagement stuff? Yeah, out there, out in your world, in your guys' world, you know, because again, like, I know what my part is, it's under this grant, I know what, you know, what I'm in charge of, but as more, for more than just the, as more than just the concept, are there social workers out there, you know, engaging in this, are there doctors, nurses, how is this being implemented at the actual clinic le level? This being consumer? Being, being the, the medical model. The medical home model generally? Yeah. Do you see what I'm? Do you see what I'm saying? Because we're talking about it in concept. We're talking about it in how you know what best practices and how it should operate and those kinds of things. But I'm curious in other communities how it's being actually implemented in the different offices and medical facilities and those kinds of things. So I think if if your question is medical home writ large. That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. We're not talking about best practices in the medical home as a general matter for providing, you know, high quality care. What what I, what we're talking about is an area that I think sometimes doesn't get as much attention, which is how are you engaging patients um, in the design of the medical home model and what its policies are going to be and how it's going to work and how it's going to be evaluated, which is a completely different question that I would submit to you probably very few people are doing. And then second of all, how are medical homes engaging patients individually through shared decision making and care planning? And that right, I think right. a lot more people are doing, a lot more right. medical homes are doing. So, so when, when you're talking in, in concept about all these things, you're talking about sort of uh, medical facilities that are already attempting to operate as a medical home yes. or under a medical home model. Yes. Okay, okay. That, that's making, I understand now. Because see, okay. I'm at the end where we have a clinic who's not oper who wants to operate under a medical home model, but is not yet doing so. And so it's my job to figure out how to implement that and how to put that into place. So I'm at a little different place than some people are who are listening to this. So okay. it's very, very helpful, and I'm very grateful to be here. So. Okay. So um, thank you for your question. And I'm looking at, um, you know, we're, we're, we're at our witching hour here. Um, and so what I'd like to do, I know there are a couple of unanswered questions. I'd like to um, give the last question to Stuart Green, since we haven't heard Stuart's voice yet, and then ask those of you who have remaining questions to either submit them in the box and um, hopefully and we'll get a copy of them or to follow up with Relia. So Stuart, um, do you have a question? Um, it was a comment and I guess a question. You've, you've, you've partly answered it just in what you've talked about. It has to do with the sort of strength with which we engage patients on the design end uh, as well as the practice end. And uh, I guess my, my question or concern it's, um, has to do with the, with, with, the, with the strength of that. I think that uh, the idea of, uh, of collaborating uh, in a very I guess I always use the word robust the way with uh, community-based patient uh, support and advocacy organizations uh, comes up for me a lot. For example, uh, we have residency programs here, family medicine residency programs, where we're implementing uh, uh, the model and we have NCQA level one uh, uh, for the most part. Um, and we have patient advisory uh, groups already meeting a couple of times a year. Um, so, as you mentioned, I think that's even that that sort of relatively mild level of having patient advisory groups yeah. uh, doesn't seem to uh, certainly isn't universally happening yet. It's sort of in in, in you know in development, uh, lots of places. Um, but beyond that, the idea of really collaborating uh, uh, on design with uh, local community-based organizations. Uh, yeah. you know, who maintain their own strength and standing outside of our systems. So I just, I guess if it's a question, my question is, do you, do you, do you see that being clearly articulated as a sort of a goal for PCMH development, and do you see strong steps in that direction, uh, and ultimately toward even more stronger, stronger and formalized roles for patient participation in these, uh, in these models? 
Yes, absolutely, and I, that's a fabulous question. And um, so we did a toolkit, the National Partnership did a toolkit last year mm -hmm. to support these community-based consumer organizations um, because we were really hopeful that we would start to see health plans and employers and um, you know the provider community begin to engage them in design and begin mm -hmm. to have conversations. So we developed a toolkit that would support mm -hmm their involvement, um, but, but I think we're not seeing the real strength of collaboration that we were hoping to, and so that's something that I would imagine we would draw out of, um, of this work in best practices. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got some hard thinking, and I hope you will join us, Stuart, for that, mm -hmm. about how you can really ensure strong collaboration and, and that it's not just sort of in name only or, mm -hmm. you know, you just sort of got four people that, you right. know, or, and I think it takes you to defining who is a community organization that can represent the consumer voice, because a lot of people will say employers can mm. be a consumer, because we're all consumers. Mm. Um, but, you know, we define consumer very differently, most importantly, don't have a big financial stake in the operation of the healthcare system. Right, so, right. Anyway, so I think that's absolutely the end goal. That's a great response, and I'd love to help work on that in any way. Fantastic. So mm -hmm. that's a perfect mm -hmm. way for me to say please email Relia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for everybody on the phone, email him and make sure he's got your email address. Um, and Relia, it might be worth doing one email to everybody on the phone just to say if you're interested and allow them to reply to you. Is that possible? That'd be great. Yeah, that sounds, great. that sounds like a great idea, Christine. Great. So we will do that, and we will hope that you will be willing to um, to join us. We meet monthly, um, at usually the last Friday of the month. The next call will be on uh, May 28th at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, and we'll send out an agenda and call in information for that. Um, Julie, do you have anything um, that you want to add before we wrap up? I don't. I just want to thank everybody for great input and ideas, and I've taken some notes, and um, I think this has definitely furthered our conversation. I appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Um, and we'll be following up with you. So thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.